Dámy a pánové, dobré odpoledne. Vítejte na historicky prvním webináři Združení automobilového průmyslu. Ty poslední dva měsíce, myslím, že pro nás, pro všechny, byly velmi složité. Vy víte lépe než kdo jiný, že v podstatě 90 firm Združení automobilového průmyslu bylo výrazně dotčeno tou krizí, která se tak rychle rozpoutala. Byli jste donuseni výrobu zastavit, výrazně omezit, částečně omezit jen málo kdo a výroba mohl pokračovat a i ty firmy byly tím, jak ta krize nabíhala, extrémně silně dotčení. My tady v sekretariátu Združení samozřejmě tu situaci jsme nejenom sledovali, ale snažili jsme se především aktivně pomáhat, komunikovat ty výzvy, které před autoprůmyslem této nelehké době stály směrem k pládě v tom prvním období, kdy docházelo postupně přitvrzování těch omezujících pravidel, zavádění těch hygienických opatření, to byly uh, diskuze o tom, jak zajistit příjezd pendlerů, stejně tak jako v tom závěru. Na, nakonec otázka těch zavírání hranic se podařilo v několika případech ty přechody aspoň částečně udržet. Uh, diskutovali jsme s vládou i ta hygienická opatření, kdy a jak měla být přijímána teď v posledních dnech a týdnech, naopak zase rozvolňovaná. V té hlavní fázi jsme velmi intenzivně byli u těch diskuzí ohledně zajištění likvidity ve, firm, ve firmách. Ten program Kurz Arbeitu teď se zase velmi intenzivně diskutuje jeho přelití do odpuštění sociálních odvodů. Výhodné půjčky. COVID-3, COVID+, to, co všechno teď přichází, ale nakonec i ta evropská regulace, kterou je naše odvětví velmi intenzivně zasaženo. Nejedná se jenom o ty tolik diskutované C odvojky z automobilů, ale i další předpisy, jako typové schválení, které nabíhá už od 1. 9. nebo nová norma Euro 6, kde v podstatě tomu, aby reálně byly implementovány, nejsou v dnešní situaci dány podmínky. Není prováděcí legislativa často, a nebyly kapacity pro homologace, čili je tam celá řada věcí, kde se Združení autoprůmyslu se snažilo aktivně podporovat ty potřeby, které to naše odvětví má. Teď samozřejmě je doba, kdy výroba se postupně rozjíždí, otevřela se většina těch výrobních závodů finalistů. Je jasné, že i když se hodně hovoří o tom rozjezdu té výroby, že ten rozjezd je cokoliv jiného než plynulý, naopak ta, ta ten rozjezd je dneska v řadě firm na třetinové, na dvou třetinové výrobě a rozhodně ta plynulost je něco, co nám se bude velmi chybět a na čem musíme pracovat. Proto s vládou teď aktuálně diskutujeme o opatřeních na podporu trhu z vozidly v České republice, ale i vlastně napříč Evropou. A proto a také si myslíme, že je potřebovat další diskuzi o opatřeních, které pomohou rozjezdu té výroby u vás ve firmách. A z toho důvodu nakonec i tato série seminářů, kde bychom rádi s vámi diskutovali témata, která dnes jsou palčivá, která firmy řeší. Na tom dnešním otázka, co nebo jak dneska postupovat, pokud jsem firma, pokud bych uvažoval dál o digitalizaci, automatizaci výroby v situaci, kdy samozřejmě ty finanční zdroje a rozhodnutí často matek jdou proti tomu, tak jak bych měl a mohl uvažovat v situaci, kdy je samozřejmě v jiných zemích napříč Evropou ty firmy mohou být, mohou na tom být lépe, ty peníze, prostředky na, na, na ty investice nadále mít mohou, čili je to první ze série seminářů, který bychom v následujících dvou měsících rádi udělali. Využili je jako prostor pro diskuzi s vámi, pro získání podnětu z vás. Než předám slovo dnešním hlavním účastníkům semináři, což jsou zástupců firmy, firmy IDC, analytické společnosti, Jan Borian, jakožto výzkumný ředitel a pan Lorenzo Veronesi, Research Manager IDC, tak uh, jenom bych rád připomněl, že uh, ta dnešní, ten dnešní webinář bude probíhat angličtině. Uh, po té úvodní části, zhruba 20-25 minut uh, přednášky, bude uh, probíhat panelová diskuze, kdy se k nám uh, připojí uh, šéf Koyo Bearings, Petr Novák a zároveň člen představenstva Autosat a kde budete moci pokládat dotazy všem účastníkům, tím zásobcům a analytické společnosti IDC a, a stejně tak i Petru Novákovi. A to pokládání dotazů lze dělat pomocí tlačítka, 
www.nr.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz.cz
all these things are playing a bigger role than COVID and they're playing in a much longer time frame. So we need to be aware that this is a disruption, but we need to prepare to work out this problem, but also to be able to be ready for the future disruption that are gonna, gonna come. And this is a very big shock because it, it, it's, I said, it's, very, it's very significant. It affects the production, it affects the value chain just in time, so it affects all the supply, but also affects the demand because you cannot, uh, you cannot um, uh, sell your products because there's no buyers for the final product, for the automotive. There is uh, also very difficult to do trade shows, to promote your product, to, to foster the demand because, of course, all the media, everything is, is talking about this, uh, this crisis and uh, people cannot move. So it's very difficult to generate demand. So it's a combined shock that is forcing company to burn a lot of money. But as I said, this is not an excuse to idle. We, we, we show in the, in, the, in the slide and we presented that many times already. Uh, digital transformation is not years away. It's already happened. And uh, this thing is just a wake up call. Uh, you need to focus on, on transforming. And of course, most of company in, in, in manufacturing, but also in automotive, particularly, they, they took very harsh measures to cope with this transformation. And I don't want to go through the news, you all read it, but this is really, really significant. But there is uh, one point I wanted to tell you is that companies which have a better way of managing the processes is doing a little bit better. So we have been very, very lucky this time because we were we could run a survey uh, in March and April. So what you see here is the results of a survey that was really, really fresh. We interviewed 800 companies worldwide, and we asked them, not, not in automotive sector, only in the, in the world of manufacturing, but we asked them two questions. First of all, how do you think your supply chain is compared to your competitors? And then we asked another question, say, how do you think, how much you think coronavirus, COVID, is affecting your supply chains? And you see that while everybody is affected, Everybody thinks is affecting the, the majority thinks there's big, big problems here. But, but you see, the best in class are doing a little bit better. The green side uh, is, uh, is much higher in the best in class than in the laggards. And even more importantly, you see uh, this uh, orange, orange bar, which, is, which means we know it's going to be disruptive, but we don't know how. We don't know what the impact is going to be. This is very low in the best in class. It means that when you have a control of your processes and your supply chain, you have less uncertainty. And I think in this case, it's very important. Maybe you know what's happening, something is happening, but you know what, what is going on. So that's very important. And even another thing is very important here. We ask the same, same, a similar question. We say, how do you think is like, how much do you think is like a competitor is going to disrupt your business, take over your space? And you see, again, most of companies say, oh, we, we really think our competitors are getting competitive advantage. We're gonna be disrupted. But again, the company with the best, better, better supply chain processes, they say more often, ah, I don't, we, it's unlikely, okay? This is not happening. So again, uh, it's very important to have your, your operational process in place and in a good condition. Also, very interesting is, is that as you can see, the red bar outweighs very significantly the green bar. <laughs> and you will say, if everybody thinks about being disrupted, where are these disruptors? Everybody thinks somebody else is going to take over a competitive advantage. Nobody thinks we are the guys taking over the business. We are the guy we need new business over our competitors. So I think an important takeaway here for companies like you is, is to understand that uh, um, everybody's on the same boat. Everybody's worried. You are not alone. This is very understandable. But but you have to be optimistic because. Everybody is very, is very worried, but probably there are opportunities to, to do something positive. And we believe technology is a key role to play here. So uh, there are some examples of, uh, of a deployment in, in the automotive sector. You see virtual reality for design, you see robots for automating the production. And, and when you ask company, the same survey, we ask company, what are the biggest benefit you, you can get in your supply chain? What is the areas driving most change? Technology first and foremost. And this is very important because without technology, you cannot control your process. And we're gonna see later on why technology is important, but this is very important to, 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 to underline that, that companies at the moment, I remember this survey was taken yesterday, literally, in the world, they're all seeing technology as the driver for 
business improvement and to face this situation. So super important and we can see also in another way. Uh, we have been tracking since 2013 the performance in terms of revenue and profits of, uh, of a panel of uh, 1,000 uh, manufacturing companies. Then we divided them into two groups, the company that were good in digital transformation and the companies that were less advanced in digital transformation. And then we track their, their performance over time. And you see the companies that were more advanced in digital transformation are doing significantly better and consistently. And you see a divided margin. So companies that have more digital technologies in place and they can use them better to transform the processes are outperforming their competitors that are not as advanced. So again, this was already happening. You see the data up to last year. We still are collecting the data of, of this year because a lot of companies are failing to report their 2019 results. And this was before coronavirus. So this is just a very important trend we need to keep, keep in track of, but also it's very, I think it's very important for you to see the, the practical effect that this technology makes. And, and we see a lot of company uh, struggle in moving ahead their supply chain, their transformation. This is really the digi where this digital divide happens. Only a fraction of company are able to eventually embed their technology in such a strong way in their processes that they can transform the processes. You see, a fraction of company are on the level five of the digital maturity. Most of company tend to stuck, get stuck in the lower levels. So it means the digital transformation for them is a pilot or like a series of initiatives that are somehow disconnected. And this is uh, really uh, a big problem we see how, and we need to find a way to help companies to try to move the digital steps forward because as you can see, there are only a handful of companies in the market that are able to be really, really digital. And, and this is creating a, a lot of problems because you see this is creating also a digital divide. But the good news is that companies are, as said, are not idling the investment. So this is another survey we did very, very recent. It's actually a survey we run every week to gauge the pulse of the market. And uh, this is the latest result where we say, uh, what, how are your COVID impacting your, your digital transformation project? As you can see, only 7% uh, companies say we, 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 are, we are suspended our digital projects. Most companies say we are revaluating the project. And what evaluating means several things. It means you, you check who's doing that. You maybe assess the real business viability of the project. You check different, uh, different uh, the supplier, for example, is supplier is the right one. But long story short, there is still projects going on. The only thing is that you have less money to carry them. You have less focus maybe. You need to make sure you don't waste any resources in IT and this type of project. So you have to be more focused. But doesn't mean they, they, they are not relevant anymore. Everybody is still carrying on with their projects. And what are these projects? What are these investments? So we wanted to show what, what your peers are doing. And this is really um, something we gather uh, from the field by talking by talking with companies uh, like you in the automotive sector. And we, we try to take put together the initiatives and try to organize initiatives in a, in a more uh, coherent, uh, coherent framework. And this is just an example from a, a Mercedes plan. You see they starting putting this, um, this separator to, 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 to allow people to work uh, uh, without uh, uh, spreading, uh, spreading uh, uh, the virus inside the factory. Uh, so there are many drivers for these investments and it's very important, as I said, people are evaluating their investments so they need to see what is important now. Uh, first of all, it's very obvious to try to modernize the remote work capabilities. This is something every company is doing, every, every company, uh, because we interviewed, because they, they, they really, they really um, since they cannot have people uh, going to the office or entering the factory, they need to find a ways to, to, to transform the way of working in their, in, their, in their organization. And this also has another edge, uh, aspect. So since you cannot have people in the factory, you need to invest in more automation. You need to invest in capabilities to be able to understand what's going on in your factory without having somebody next to the machine and reading the panel, without having somebody uh, to really fill out paper forms and inputting uh, and storing the information in, in, in these paper forms. You need to have a digital way to access to your machine and to the machine stats and the machine data. 
and so this calls for more IoT, more diagnostics, more, more, more clever way to, to access your technology to your information, but also more in automation because of course you have less people, you need to automate in a different way. And, uh, and, and also uh, uh, for, 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 for company, your position, very important, achieve resilience in the supply chain. When you have control of the information in your processes, you can take better decisions, you can change the processes when the situation is mutating. You can maybe have a demand slump or a demand peak. Uh, the supplier doesn't work anymore. Uh, your, your materials are not the right quality. You need to take decisions. And the more information you have, the better is, this decision is going to be. So it's very important to, to have that in place. And uh, this is just a, a, um, a really high-end review of the main initiatives that we see happening in the, in the sector. And we're going to drill down later. Uh, but uh, the first one is to change the production flow and, and make the production more in line with the needs of the demand. So we see some, some news that came uh, from, uh, from, from the different, uh, different manufacturing companies. This happens across, across the board. So important, changing, uh, updating the way that you run your operations. Uh, the traditional production capacity maybe is too much now. Uh, you need to change a little bit the scheduling, you need to change your product lines. It's a very difficult task, it's not simple, but you need to be able to find a balance between running, uh, being productive and being uh, effective while without incurring in too much costs. The second point that is partly linked to that is, is of course, now you can produce. Uh, in Czech Republic, I understand the, the public health issue is less bad than it is in, uh, in, in other countries. Uh, but still, you need to have all this necessary uh, health uh, protection uh, devices in place. You need to be able to track the people in your plant. You need to transform the way the process are run and people operate in the plant. And we see, for example, a technology here that for this piloting that is using smart devices, smart watches to track the people interactions so that you know who's being in touch with whom. And if you have like a, the, an occurrence of a positivity case, you can isolate the person very easily without the need to close the whole plant to sanitize everything and to, and to create a huge damage. And also another important part, the company are realizing that they can collaborate more in innovation. You see a lot of companies in the automotive sector have collaborated with their peers or with companies and other industries to provide medical devices and, and personal protection uh, equipment to their uh, uh, to, the, to the hospitals and to the good. And, and this was something that was done out of a public, public need and uh, a very strong mandate, you know, out of charity if you want. But, but uh, I think some companies are learning now that uh, it is possible. You can collaborate with other companies. You can transform your processes by sharing information and sharing uh, the capacity somehow. So while this is more like an experiment, we believe that this can be can be uh, very important in the future and can lead to new to new uh, to new uh, to new uh, to new ways of working. So all of these initiatives we try to map into a number of uh, of uh, streams, and we pretty much we found out the three main phases of the digital initiatives. The first phase is what we call the a react, and this is really what's been going on over the past few months company needed to understand uh, what uh, was the first thing they had to do and what the situation was really, you know? So first of all, you need to have a supplier risk assessment, understanding who or your supplier is viable or not viable. We have some company that went to great length with us to describe the supplying management strategy. Uh, you need to enable, as I said, decentralized work. You need to um, impact uh, uh, the crisis and make can simulation on the crisis impact on your financials, very important. And also you start to understand how to manage these new hygiene rules in the factory and maybe using the environmental uh, health and safety systems. Some companies use the MES, manufacturing solution system, but the idea is that you need to track these new things in your factory in order to run. And you need to learn to do it very easily, very rapidly, because this is a new way of working for, for a while. But then companies also preparing the next phase when, when they will have to live through a situation where the demand is going to be very, 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 very diverse, very, very mutable, very, very fluctuating. Uh, you will see 
this opening, counting closing, supply chain will be partially returned to normally, partially they will change. So you will face a continuously moving business situation. And, uh, and so you need to deploy new technology. And we see, for example, market intelligence, data-driven, getting closer connection with your customers to understand exactly where the problems are, how you can solve the problems. It's also, if they have a demand, try to understand it sooner than, than it's too late. Uh, investing in transportation and logistics agility, investing more collaborative, say B2B networks with your partners, um, uh, reassess your product portfolio. Some products may be very viable today, some products may be not, not so profitable now, so you need to understand that. This company are all working on that. A lot of automation, the factory sensorization and, uh, and new production scheduling technology. So this is a sort of a phase two and we think it's going to be like this summer, you know, September, October. And then we believe that the, we don't know exactly well how they, how they, how they recovery would be, would be a U shaped, it would be like a, a bathtub. So very long flat line and then back up. It would be an L, so no recovery at all. We don't know. But what we know is that it will be different. Even if, if we, we see a good recovery, the situation will be very different than it is now. So company also saying, okay, how is going to be the business next year? What are the skills we will need to have? And, and what, so how we should, should, be, should be investing now to be able to have these skills in place in the future. And one, for example, be able to redesign your factory network or your supply network. And also, and also being able to control your operation more remotely. So I said digital was already in place, you know, industry for those, mar manufacturing. But, but more importantly, uh, being able to, this is just amplifying this trend. This trend is just becoming faster and more important than ever. Uh, for example, start enabling your digital channels or digital sales force. That's very important because, because you cannot have face-to-face -face contact anymore. And also there are technologies that, for example, are augmented reality that can be very useful for, for, for example, for enabling uh, less interaction between people on, on the show floor and remote control again of the operation uh, using these devices. So it's a big size of strategies. Of course, if you have questions or, or more, we can, we can drill down on that. But at the moment, uh, we move to the next uh, slide, uh, which is that uh, we talk about this collaboration thing. This is just an example. And honestly, some of these initiatives already failed or didn't go very well. So it's not simple. But we believe this is a very good opportunity for companies uh, in the future, especially when you have a situation of overcapacity. You need to optimize your capacity. You need to develop new products very rapidly. So collaborating the ecosystem with companies outside your ecosystem. We, we've been advocating that for for a few years from now. And now we see this really happening uh, for the first time in a mass scale. And, uh, and uh, it's really a good sign. And we think that for the future, this is gonna become more and more and more uh, uh, a traditional uh, a way of working, uh, also in the, in, the, in the factory. So to conclude, uh, first of all, it's very important that uh, you make sure that digital is as a center of your business thinking. Uh, so um, think about flexibility, think about agility, think about the technology that allows that you to achieve that. And we have this sentence here that says from just in time to just in case, which, uh, which may be a little bit provocative, but the idea is that you need to have a little bit of uh, extra cost and redundancy in the network, in the materials, in the inventories to be able to make sure your, your, your capacity, you don't get disrupted by this sudden, sudden uh, disruption that can happen and we, we don't know exactly, but we know it's gonna be a very bumpy ride. So try to, to make a little bit more flexibility in your processes. And very important to start looking at more automation and digital automation in the factory, because of course you will probably have less and less chances to deploy people in the factory. So try to, Make sure you, you can uh, uh, understand and, and gather information the best way possible, but without necessarily a human intervention. And, and also open your eyes if you want and try to see outside your business, try to look at the opportunities that you can have in collaborating with other companies. Uh, not necessarily within the automotive sector, but also outside, there's a lot of knowledge. 
uh, outside the industry that can be leveraged in your industry as well. And, uh, and we see this already happening and it's going to be more and more important. And on the right hand side, um, there's another result from a survey. Um, uh, we asked companies uh, how your IT vendor has, 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 uh, is happening, is uh, helping you. And you see only, uh, and some companies say no, they did nothing. But on the other end, in many situations, there have been some flexibility with contracts, attractive conditions, extended free uh, of charge support for implementation. So IT vendors now are very, very active in trying to support their customer to stay, to stay alive and to be profitable so that they can, they can support them in the future. No? So again, uh, try to go to your IT vendor, try to discuss with them, have an open discussion because sometimes there's a good opportunity also to engage with them get a good deal, good, get a good contract, get some free support. This is a list of things that they are actively doing for their customers in all industries, okay, not just in automotive, but I mean, that's the last bit I wanted to just uh, let you know because also the other side of the market, the IT market is really, really eager at helping out. So that's, that's very important. And uh, with that has been said, I, I, I will hand back over to, to the team uh, for the Q&A. Lorenzo, uh, thank you. Perfect. Lorenzo, once again, thank you. Uh, now we will be joined by uh, Peter Novak, uh, boss of uh, Coil Bearings and a member of the board of uh, our association. So, so welcome for all the panelists. Uh, we have uh, some 15 minutes uh, uh, time for discussion, for questions. Uh, if there are indeed any questions uh, from our uh, uh, hosts, uh, then, then please use the Q&A button uh, down below on your screen uh, to, to put those questions. Uh, I will start uh, with something that it's perhaps uh, sort of the most pressing and most obvious question and would direct it uh, to Lorenzo. Uh, considering uh, the current situation, uh, that the companies are under immense uh, financial pressure, under immense uh, liquidity pressure, how should they justify investments, any further investments in digitalization uh, under given conditions? Yes, um, so as I said, um, many, many companies are looking at investments now in a, in a, in a, in a very uh, careful way. We saw in the presentation there were about 70% of companies are uh, in Europe are, are looking at reassessing their investments. So I think the justification should be um, really uh, based on the, uh, the cost uh, effectiveness and the value for money of the, of the investment. Uh, there are some, as I said, we try to map the investment in the three phases just to say there are something that you have to do now and make sure that you do it now, but uh, also make sure that if you start too late, it's too late because then maybe it won't be relevant anymore. So you need to understand what is a short-term investment that has to be now, otherwise just don't do it because then we'll, we'll be, it would miss the time, the opportunity. There are some other investments that prepare your company for the future. So you need first to reassess what you have done before and, and, and see whether, whether it's still valid. In case you understand that something is just a, a waste of money at the moment, I mean, I think it would be reasonable to start stopping it, but make sure that you invest somewhere in something that makes sense. So internal evaluation is very important. And we already see uh, with Jan uh, very few situations where companies are coming to us with these uh, projects, instant projects we call them, because they say, we already evaluated that, we never implemented because it was not relevant at the time, it was more nice to have, and now with this situation, it becomes mission critical. For example, digital channels. Uh, so we're doing some projects with companies establishing digital channels now. They already did the research, the project was ready, they put in a, on hold in a drawer, and now they, they, they say now is priority number one because the situation has changed, we already have it. We know the partners, we know the providers, but we know to know how we can implement this technology. So it's the, the idea is that we need to evaluate the projects, look also what you've done already, and maybe something that was not relevant maybe in the past because maybe it was seen too much, a little bit uh, too futuristic, uh, a little bit rocket science. Maybe now it's perfect. So assess what you have already in place, 
create open collaboration and uh, communication among people because a lot of the time uh, there are a lot of ideas in the organization that are not, not exploited. So uh, we see sometimes uh, explode, uh, make your, uh, open up your drawers, explode them, uh, just to make sure nobody hits with vital information in the drawers and, uh, and everybody's on the same page. And that's, that's really, but I mean, the justification for the project should be very apparent because without that, and we see continuous evidence that company are really looking at that, but that digital transformation will be very, very difficult to carry on their business. It's already impossible. Then it would be really, really, really a thing that uh, cannot go on. Okay. Uh, well, uh, before we actually get to the specifics of uh, what investments could be done, uh, I would like to ask uh, Peter, uh, with your expertise and experience uh, by, from leading the company, um, do you see any sort of differentiation factors? Uh, uh, what can actually help companies to, to go on with that kind of investments in, uh, given the current climate? I mean, is there anything the government can do or the, the, the management of the companies themselves can do to, uh, to avoid, uh, avoid uh, that kind of investment being either cancelled or postponed? So good afternoon. First of all, hello everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so thank you very much for inviting me to this interesting webinar and being able to speak at the panel. Uh, we truly believe in digitalization and I think this is one of the core competitive advantages that the companies have that purely believe in the tools of digitalization. So it's been clearly shown that those companies that uh, invest in digitalization have higher returns on investment. Uh, in our case, uh, we, do, we do have a digitalization plan that's uh, in place which covers many, many areas and it's been proven in our case that uh, for digitalization we uh, really see reduction of costs. It's costs for scrap, for material, for labor, uh, it's costs for overhead uh, due to, for example, lower maintenance costs, etc. So uh, it's been proven that uh, those companies are more cost competitive it gives us better flexibility because we can uh, react to market much faster. We can reduce our lead times. We are more agile as a company. So uh, I think this is this unknown facts. Uh, as we have a roadmap for digitalization, which clearly shows what we want to do by when, uh, and we truly believed in that, uh, the latest developments, uh, unfortunately, has significantly influenced uh, on our priorities. Uh, we are part of JTA Corporation, Japanese owner and owner Toyota. And uh, in our case, uh, due to cash flow situation, pure cost reductions, uh, we really have to strictly follow new rules which are in place. In the past, for example, very openly, the payback was below three years and the project was uh, let's say approved, uh, was, uh, if we uh, justified it very well with the information I explained on the cost reductions then, and the payback was there, there was no reason not to invest. And uh, today the situation has completely changed and the new rules are in place that only absolute, absolutely necessary investments will be approved. There is a rule in place of less than one year payback, for example, in our case, uh, which uh, completely changes their priorities. Uh, in order not to, let's say, stop everything because we, can't, we want to continue in this way, we do have projects which uh, centrally are driven or by planned. We would like to uh, push uh, forward. But one thing that can help the companies is any EU or Czech government funding that would be available for digitalization, which will, of course, at the end help uh, in terms of payback calculation. Uh, in terms of financing, another thema which now discussed uh, that for financing there could be some help from the governments uh, because the cost of money today is so low on the market. It's good news, of course. Uh, the difference between, between zero interest and very low interest we pay today, it's not so significant. So purely the advantage that we currently see today is any EU funding in this, in this regard. So sorry for, for this, uh, let's say, um, answer, but uh, pragmatically, uh, we just changed current situation uh, very openly. Uh, the companies will have to think very, very well, uh, very strongly, and have a very good detailed analysis of those uh, competitive advantages and then make those priorities 
an investor where it really makes sense. Thank you. Um, uh, Honzo, in that regard, I mean, uh, you uh, from IDC have actually a broad overview of the situation uh, across Europe. I mean, this does not concern Czech Republic only. The situation has 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 deep impact across the world, obviously across the EU as well, but the, the situation in different markets uh, for different companies might be quite, quite different to the ones we have right now in the Czech Republic, uh, the ones we have uh, when we speak about the supply chain of the automotive industry um, here in the Czech Republic. Uh, is there anything in, in your, uh, uh, your perspective uh, that would sort of make the situation for Czech companies uh, worse or better uh, than the one uh, that are across uh, the Europe in other member states? Is there anything that you will see uh, for, for the coming year that will influence uh, the Czech market and Czech companies uh, somehow differently uh, than, than, than other companies when it comes to perhaps to competitiveness, uh, etc.? Yeah, so I think that uh, already you can see, of, co of course, the Czech business is focused mostly on uh, being, let's say, talking uh, speaking of automotive, like be like a tier supplier, right? So that'd be the, the OEM. So, of course, there are significant dangers of being uh, or being depend uh, on uh, on the clients which are the customers which are not here in in Central Europe, right? So, and as Lorenzo said, uh, now it's the demand is very is, is very low, very weak, and uh, we don't we don't know what's going on uh, within within the next couple of months. But the thing is that, of course, I mean, so for so these like a being like a tier suppliers, sort of the, 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 the situation. I mean. You know, we probably not, not not many ways how to how the situation could improve if the if the situation in 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 the rest of the world or Europe would improve. So, but what we can see is that if the company is, has that power to be like OEM to sell sell directly, then of course uh, many companies are let's say rethinking, redesigning their business models, and now also accelerating the the way how they sell their products and their services. So we're talking for quite time about a shifting from the send the products to sign the services and uh, these services of course are based on uh, on the data and or the this digitization of the of the, of the, of the processes and of, of the products so so this is definitely be the the way the, the many many manufacturers are going to, are gonna go uh, in an, in the next month or maybe maybe even like a mid mid and long long uh, term period because of course i mean the winner is going to be the, the company which is which should be able to diversify its its revenues its portfolio and the revenues and of course to live not just from a product themselves but from uh, from a services of uh, which are connected to a product which we already sold okay. so that's yeah. so the, 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 that's the perspective maybe one more thing also what we can see or the differentiation between uh, maybe winners and losers already now but also in a uh, in the future is that uh, the company and Lawrence also talked about it so is the ability of collaboration right so the ability to create a collaborative business business collaboration environments ecosystems which has which are providing the flexibility in in the business but also in supply chain and production because of course it's very hard to be that flexible to react on any scenario which could happen uh, in a, in a world Right. Of course, if you had so much money that you can build the biggest warehouse of your products and of your of your raw materials, that's fine. But you know, I think that almost no company could afford it in that uh, in that global scale. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, the, the collaboration obviously is a huge topic. Uh, uh, we've been looking at it at least uh, since last year. Uh, I, I think we'll get to it. Uh, before that, uh, I'll have actually a sort of practical question. Uh, we are still on sort of a very high level <laughs> discussion. Uh, if, if we look a little bit deeper into it, uh, uh, are there any suggestions from Lorenzo or, or you uh, when it comes to specific investments in digitization that you will suggest uh, to the uh, supply chain uh, companies, especially here in Czech Republic, but uh, from, from your knowledge sort of where uh, where the companies are uh, so what would be the sort of the, the, the best uh, investments uh, or if there are any uh, like that that you would suggest to companies to do in that regard Lorenzo, I, I, I take it uh, I'll take it now and then switch to Lorenzo 
So what I, what I, what I think is what I can see because I visited uh, like many, maybe most of the uh, manufacturers or production companies in Czech Republic, I would invest more into digitization in terms of a, let's say, uh, reducing the reducing the labor, right? So then you can of course uh, reduce the, the personal costs to that. And of course I would try to, let's say, push digitization into my supply chain, right? Because the, the, the visibility of the supply chain enables you to have a data to and to react, let's say, upfront or in advance, right? Not, not after something, some situation is, uh, is happening. Of course, everybody's talking about the automation, right? So this is also quite a, uh, let's say, big area of investment with quite a clear payback or ROI, right? So, I mean, of course, it depends on the production program, right? So it's, you can just automize any or every every production area, right? but Again, so digitization, seamless, seamless processes, and automation. Lorenzo, if you have something to say to that. And on top of that is automation in the, in the execution, but also automation in the management and collection of information. Uh, when we talk with automakers, but also, for example, with the machine, make, machine builders, okay, assigned to the sell to the automotive business. They, when they think about the product development uh, areas, they, we did some workshop with these companies to try to guide their, their future strategy. Um, so they, what they see in uh, major ways is sometimes there is a lot of, uh, most of the factories, the, the, the information when it's collected from people uh, is very, is very uh, uncoordinated. So you may have like a lot of paper forms, a lot of, uh, of notes and sometimes this is part of a way of working which was very good and very structured but uh, what we see is that you need to try to find a way to automate this more and more to free up people time and removing them from the sort of information collection and uh, and making this more and more as an autonomous thing because of course uh, this saves a lot of uh, time and energy for them and also enables you to be more flexible in the in the in the execution of the of the process and eventually in the ability to change the process uh, because you have a lot of information ready available instead of instead of looking for the information and asking ten people to provide a report before before you can take a decision. So if you can achieve a decision making environment that really works uh, with information that comes in real time from the factory and gets integrated. In a single in a single source, be it DRP, be it the MES, be it an IoT platform, it, it doesn't really matter. But depending on the situation, but I think that's very important to be able to take decision based on the real situation of the factory, the real time data. Uh, that could be a very very differentiating capabilities because um, that's the nature of the business. Uh, thank you. I think we are uh, slowly running out of time, but uh, I guess we should have uh, 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 time for uh, one more round of questions. Uh, and before we actually get uh, get to that, I'd like to ask uh, Peter. Uh, I mean, uh, Creo, uh, uh, under your <laughs> sort of uh, leadership, has always been a, a very innovative and a company on the forefront on of uh, what we call Industry 4.0. Uh, and within the Automotive Industry Association, we also had those seminars where we had a chance uh, to discuss the implementation of specific measures of, of the Industry 4.0. How does it work for uh, this company and how perhaps the others could uh, use the, the, it for, for the benefit, sort of what are the best lessons learned. Uh, in sort of in that regard, uh, are there any uh, suggestions from yours? Of what is the investments in the last uh, time that you are sort of the most proud of uh, and, and feel that that, that makes the, the biggest difference when it comes to digitization of your company? Or, uh, or actually quite contrary, is there anything that you are missing right now and then you would be aiming uh, and, that some, and it's something obviously you can share with us. It's not uh, sort of uh, a company secret. Yeah, it's a good question and I'll be very open to uh, those that know me. Uh, regarding uh, our lessons learned, uh, we did start, let's say, 
four or five years ago with some major changes in our plan in terms of digitalization automation was done slightly before that and for digitalization we uh, we started in the areas where we see the biggest benefit obviously so this is our recommendation this is the lessons learned to really do proper analysis and understand where is your biggest benefits where is your biggest gaps and understand those very well and based on the data, you know, just start because don't be afraid because sometimes you make mistakes. I know these are big investments, but nobody says that you waste, you know, the complete investment, but you might change. You install it on one line and you change the line to another. Uh, but uh, start somewhere and as you develop and you implement, uh, you will learn and uh, you get better. And this was our experience. So we started uh, in pure data collection on, uh, let's say, machine visibility. This is also what our production system is teaching us. Uh, you have to make visible your current situation. Are you running normal or abnormal? And you should know it without asking too many people. You should know it yourself. Uh, so our teachers tell us, uh, if a 10-year-old person comes to your plant, you should, you should know you should, without asking. Are you on plan? Are you producing quality? Are you uh, all, all the measures in place? And if not, what are the corrective actions you are doing? So this was our first step is really the visualization of current situation. Uh, so we have uh, monitors that you can basically see uh, immediately production status on the machines. You can see it for the whole plant. You can see if the plant is running, if it's uh, on the breakdown, if we have a changeover. Uh, you can see if, if it's waiting for logistics. So you can see various codes uh, to set the macro view. If you go to the line, then you can see the individual line situation. You have a plan for shift. You have how many pieces you need to produce. You can see how many you're actually producing. You can see the percentage gap, pieces gap uh, compared to your plan. So these are the first, let's say, steps that we have taken. And as we developed, uh, of course, then we, in this digitalization roadmap, we want to go farther. Our biggest project that was ahead of us, and this is also, I know Jan very well, so hello Jan. Uh, also, this, some, some of the feedback that he told us is uh, that uh, what we are missing is we implement tool in one area, maybe a different tool in another area, but there should be some commonalization. There should be a platform that connects it all. And this is what we are missing. So uh, we have a plan, we have a, let's say, project already, which is prepared. Uh, we had a supplier selection for MESS uh, that will be implemented planned wide. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, due to current situation, it is not stopped, but it's on hold. And uh, the good news is uh, our owner wants to have a common, arm, common system across Europe. We have 14 plants, so uh, there's four in Czech, 14 in Europe. Uh, so it will most likely not be our solution, but at the end, we will have a solution. We will do it. It's just a matter of time. And this will be another step for us to go in more detail in terms of machine, let's say, collection. Uh, uh, in terms of changing uh, the monitoring, machine monitoring uh, and, and maintenance, uh, uh, let's say costs that are involved in that. Uh, in finance, uh, because it's not only about production, we looked in the back office and we, we decided, let's see where is our most manual work done and where we can automate those processes. So it's linked to labor reduction, cost reduction. And so we have uh, done Pareto and based on that highest manual activity, we have defined three top projects for RPA and those RPAs we'd like to do in those areas. And there is m others. We have really, <laughs> I'm very fortunate that I have uh, great people in the plan, very talented, very skilled. Uh, virtual reality, I didn't mention, but there's people in the plan completely responsible for that project. It was implemented in our training room. It helps us. It was covered for the area where we have non-stop production. So we could not afford to stop the machines, to take people away from the machines. So we really teach them outside even before they step into production. And uh, again, coming back to the people, you have to have the right people on board and give them the trust, empower them. And uh, once you have that, you know, the, the results will come. Uh, so that's just my comments. Start with the lowest hanging fruit, start where you have the biggest benefits, and then look where you can implement. Thank you. Um, we are running out of time, but I, I hope we still have time for two uh, brief uh, questions. Um, Jan, uh, you mentioned, uh, and Lorenzo also did, uh, this uh, cluster collaboration. Uh, a method. I think uh, it actually is happening to a sort, even in the Czech Republic, we've been trying to look at examples from outside, namely, for example, the Netherlands, 
Uh, but then again, I think automotive is sort of a specific beast when it comes to a real collaboration. There are you know, quality checks, there are uh, ISO standards, et cetera, et cetera. So um, are there any uh, examples or suggestions uh, when we talk about this collaboration, sort of the, the more flexible uh, ways of, of doing business, more flexible organization of the supply chains? That um, that we can learn from, look at how how do we sort of tackle it when you when you look at the Czech automotive industry. Okay, so I mean, of course, it depends on the situation. Right? If you're talking about the situation right now, so maybe I mean most of the manufacturers already already opened the plants, right, and then um, producing like uh, maybe not in, in a full capacity, but still producing. So that's of course, I mean. Traditional cooperation is uh, between the manufacturers and uh, uh, could be like universities, right, or or some science centers. But that's that's that's, that's very good. And we saw it even that, like, during this period, like Škoda Auto cooperating with the uh, Czech Technical University. There were probably even like, more stakeholders in, in in that game, right? So, but but it was quite quite a nice example how, how it works uh, how it works here in Czech Republic. And uh, so this is the this is the but this is the quite maybe like a unique situation, right? So, but really to be able to develop a, a new solution to uh, and to let's say shift the, the, the production towards be more digital, automized. Of course, that's the collaboration with the uh, with uh, some development science centers. It's clear. Uh, when it comes to the supply chain, of course, uh, there are. Maybe like different supply chain platforms, even from manufacturers. Uh, we got uh, interviews with some of with some of them, which are providing the like marketplaces for the for the three D part, three D printed parts, even for CNC parts, like from around all around the world. So this would be also quite uh, a possibility how to make your supply chain more resilient. I understand that if, if you're just like a tier, tier one, two supplier, the, the possibilities is probably not that broad as if, if you are like OEM, so you can really combine some uh, certain services. But also in automotive, you can see uh, collaborations between like a, it's a produ or manufacturers of, of some, let's say, car parts and of a service providers, like digital, digital service providers, right? Because most of the most of the T1 automotives are rather still manufacturers of the of the let's see of the iron or plastic parts. Right? They don't do that much uh, or don't create that much value from the digitization itself. Right? So, but they have to team up with some with someone to to be able to to create such a such, such a new service. Right? So, yeah, I think that uh, I mean for Czech companies, I mean Czech owned companies, there's definitely a Opportunity how to improve their business through the collaborations, especially in this era, like teaming up with some with some digital, digital service provider. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask, obviously, uh, a logical follow-up question when we talk about digitalization. Uh, <laughs> what uh, are the cyber security issues that are uh, that go hand in hand with it? But uh, I don't think we have time. I'd like to uh, use this chance to ask the one last question that has been posed by our participants, and that's basically uh, uh, concerning the situation if there are uh, pan-European or even global uh, 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 chains of uh, manufacturing uh, that should implement uh, these digital solutions. Uh, how does it work? I mean, it's obviously that one size does not easily fit all. So um, do you have a lens or any, uh, any experience or even better if uh, you would have a point with just a brief remarks uh, what your experience is with, with this and how is it tackled so that the system in the end works for all if it ha does have to. Just please a uh, quick remark from, from Jan Lorenzo and, and Peter yeah. and that will be uh, the end for today. Yeah, it's Lorenzo here. Uh, I read the question. Uh, it's, uh, it's actually a big problem because every plant is different. This was driven to problems in the past when it came to digitalization in the factory, which is, by the way, uh, one of the less digitized areas in all the organizations. Uh, because, of course, every plant is different. There are different specific different problems. So you cannot take the single solution and push on the plants. 
because like a, like a mold, because it, it won't work, it doesn't work. But what you can do is take the plant with his specificities, his, his uh, uh, automation uh, suppliers, his, his characteristic, the production flow, and then try to find a way that you can collect some specific information out of each plant in a consistent way so that then you can compare them together, for example. So when it's a platform, it means some way that sits over the plant and can reconcile information from the different areas in a, in a common way. So that even the two, three plants are very different in nature, you can still try to find a way, for example, understanding what is driving improvement in organization, no? why this plant is better than the other one, even though you don't necessarily have the same process. So it's about adding an, an extra layer of analysis and information that sits a little bit on top of the, of the actual processes. So it's not just about taking the same functionalities across all the plants, but, but collecting the information in, a, in an agreed way, in a standardized way, uh, between the plants and analyzing them uh, on, a, on a sort of common, common layer or common methodology or common uh, architecture or technology, then it depends on the situation, but uh, that's, that's really the, my sure. impression. That. Thank you, Lorenzo. Um, Peter, do you have uh, still uh, a comment on, on that uh, or uh, based on your experience, uh, because you are actually in such a position uh, in your company? Mm. It's, it's a matter of everything. There's always pros and cons. So it's just a matter of, you know, commonality. Uh, there's, there's a benefit for it, uh, for sure. Uh, as Lorenzo correctly, you know, very nicely explained, you know, you can measure the plans across each other if you have some certain KPIs which are common and you can understand the, the fundamentals of the differences for those plants. So those definitely would be advantages. But then, those, then there are specifics to each plant and uh, those you need to manage locally. Uh, so I, I, believe, I believe that it can be done, uh, but always there should be some local customization. Just quick answer. Thank you. Uh, I believe the time is running out, uh, which is uh, quite sad because uh, I feel we have uh, several more questions that, uh, that uh, should be addressed and it would be quite interesting to hear answers from, from all the panelists. So let me take this opportunity to, to thank to, uh, to Peter Novak for, for attending the panel, to thank Jan Burian and of course uh, to Lorenzo Veronese. If there are any further questions from any of the participants, please feel free to get in touch with uh, the uh, Secretariat of Automotive Industry Association. And we'll be looking forward to, to be in touch with you uh, during the next time, during the next webinars. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.